This Miami Heat team is broken, and I don't think that's an overstatement. You could sit here and say, oh, the Heat are still five games over 500 or whatever they are now that they lost three straight games. You could still say, oh, they're only two back of four. And you could say, I don't care if the rest of the East got better. I don't care if the Pacers got Siakam and the Knicks got Ananobi and the Celtics did all those moves in the offseason and the, the Milwaukee Bucks got Dame. You could say, I don't care because what happened last year? Who was the last team standing? It was the Miami Heat and they were in the NBA Finals. Now, that last point, I definitely do put some credence to because the Heat ran it back last offseason. A lot of Heat fans were mad. They said you can't compete with the, the rapidly improving East. But who was the last team standing? It was still the Miami Heat. But at this point of the season, the way things are looking for the Miami Heat right now, I don't think it's an overstatement to say that this team is broken. Now, Excuse my voice if it's a little rash. I just did a 43 minute live stream after the Heat beat the Orlando Magic, which that game just ended like an hour ago now, because I was gonna make this video directly after that pitiful, embarrassing game. Uh, but I said, I, I'm very annoyed. I'm very frustrated at the moment. I know a lot of Heat Nation are feeling the same way, so I just wanted to go come and talk with y'all. Uh, so check that out if y'all wanna hear my instant thoughts and make sure to subscribe and like for future live streams that I may be doing. That was like my first live stream I ever really done on this channel, at least in a while. So it wasn't fancy, didn't have, the be have all the bells and whistles. I was still trying to figure it out, uh, but we had a good time. But I wanted to come here and make this video and talk about how I think the Heat can be fixed. Now, I did drop a podcast yesterday on my, my Believe in Miami Heat podcast, so make sure y'all go check that out. And I briefly talked about a trade where maybe the Heat get Terry Rozier, uh, who said, you know, made the news that said his, his preferred destination is the Miami Heat. Now, I don't think Terry Rozier is in, a, is in a spot where he can start demanding trades and picking a list, but we do know he at least would like to be in Miami. Uh, and I also said that if the Heat could somehow, you know, uh, compound that trade with another trade for Lowry Markkinen. Well, now you're talking about a team that might have a legitimate shot to win an NBA title. And I said, I said in the podcast that eventually I'd like to make a video going into full detail. Well, this is that video. I thought it would be in a few weeks as we get closer to the February 8th trade deadline. But after that embarrassing, pitiful lack of effort, just, just straight up disrespectful to watch performance versus the Orlando Magic, what better time to make a video talking about how this Heat team can save their season because they're broken right now. So I want to get right into it here. Essentially, this is the monster deal that I cooked up. Uh, we'll kind of break it down uh, segment by segment here. So for starters, we have the Miami Heat getting Terry Rozier from the Hornets and the Hornets sending over Kyle Lowry and a first round pick. Now, is this a lot of value for Terry Rozier? Well, no, I don't necessarily think so. But the reason I think the Hornets would do it is because of his contract situation, which I'm going to go, oh, as I just kicked my camera. Uh, I'm mad, just like the rest of Heat Nation, man. We all mad because we got to make some moves because the last time the Heat made a move to acquire a player was Nemanja B. Lisa. So let that sit with you for a second. Uh, so looking at Terry Rozier's contract situation, uh, he has two and a half more years left on his deal, making about $23, $24 million a year. And he will be, he's currently 29, so he'll be 31 by the time that contract is over. Now, that's a lot of money for a few years for a guy who doesn't necessarily fit the timeline of a young and, and growing Charlotte Hornets team. They got LaMelo Ball, who's very ball dominant. Of course, Terry Rozier is the same. That team sucks again this year. They'll have another high draft pick. And just overall in general, it do, uh, Terry Rozier is not a guy that fits their timeline. And to trade a guy with several years left making a ton of money is not a very easy thing to do. So while I think there will be a lot of suitors that would want Terry Rozier, I'm not sure how many teams have that big an expiring contract that they could send back over to the Charlotte Hornets. Because in any deal that the Charlotte Hornets do involving Terry Rozier, they're going to want back expiring money so they can maybe go out into the, the free agency and get some more complimentary pieces, maybe some vets that could help uh, help their young guys grow and improve, uh, or just other pieces that can help them not be one of the worst teams in the entire league next season. Uh, and that's what the Heat have in Kyle Lowry's large expiring contract. And then to also entice them further, they'd be attaching a first round pick. Now, moving on to the Jazz portion of this trade right here. I have the Miami Heat receiving Lowry Marginen, 
Taylor Horton Tucker and Chris Dunn. I was about to say Kendrick Dunn because I was thinking of Kendrick Nunn. But no, Larry Markin and Taylor Horton Tucker and Chris Dunn in exchange for Tyler Hero, Kayla Martin, Nikola Jovic, and two first round picks. Now, Heat fans, I know you're going to hate this trade. I know it. But when you look at, for, you might say it's an overpay, but when you look at what the Pacers just traded for Pascal Siakam, it was three first round picks and nothing else. I have the Miami Heat sending two first round picks and Tyler Hero and Nikola Jovic, who each on their own might be able to get you a first round pick, at least for Tyler Hero, Nikola Jovic, maybe a few seconds, not probably not a first at this point because he hasn't been playing very well, but it's still a comparable package to what the Siakam deal got. Now, a lot of people might say, oh, well, Siakam's a better player, which yes, he certainly is a better player than Larry Markkinen at this point. But Siakam was an expiring contract. A lot of times, guys on the last year of their deal don't acquire as much value because the team trading for that guy is scared they could just walk in free agency. If Pascal Siakam doesn't re-sign with the Pacers, they just traded three first-round picks for nothing. So even though Siakam's a better player, I do think the contract situations mean they'll get a comparable package. And I think this is it. Now, looking here at uh, Larry Mark and his contract, he also has a year and a half left at $18 million-ish a season, which is a great contract. Uh, and I, th the issue is, though, I'm not sure if the Jazz would trade him, right? We heard his name in the trade rumors a lot uh, because the Jazz weren't very good. And if they weren't very good, maybe they're scared they can't resign Larry Markkinen next offseason, meaning if they were going to trade him, they'd have to trade him now. Because if they wait until next season, well, now he's an impending free agent and his trade value might not be as high, just like we were saying with Pascal Siakam. The issue is, though, the Jazz have actually been playing very well of late. They've won like seven out of their last 10. Uh, and that team as a whole is just is just on a roll right now. So maybe they do want to hold on to Larry Markkinen uh, and just see how far this current rendition of their team can go. Because also, he's a young guy. He fits their timeline well. And if they feel confident they can resign him, well, then why would they want to let him walk? Uh, and on top of that, the Jazz also have a lot of nice young guards that they like, like Colin Sexton. Uh, Jordan Clarkson's not old, but he's still a, a really uh, decent guard. And obviously, their rookie, Keontae George, who they do like a lot. So they probably wouldn't want Tyler Hero, even though he's white and Utah likes the white guys. I'm not going to lie. I, I feel like I'd be remiss if I don't throw that fact in there. Uh, only half kidding. Uh but it's kind of the same issue that we saw with why Portland didn't want Tyler Hero because they had all those young guards there like Simons and Shaden Sharp and whoever else. But uh, I do want to say, though, that if the Jazz were to accept this trade, I think it benefits the Heat because, one, you're also getting Chris Dunn, who was out of the league for a little bit, came back, and he's actually playing very well for the Jazz. He's not playing like a ton of minutes a night or anything. Uh, but he's, I got it right here. He's uh, averaging 18 minutes a night. Uh, but the thing with him is he's very good defensively. And if you're the Miami Heat and you'd be having a starting lineup of, you know, starting backcourt of Terry Rozier and Duncan Robinson, you're going to need some sort of perimeter guard that can play defense, you know, uh, especially if you're losing Caleb Martin in this trade as well. So now you'd be getting Chris Dunn, who maybe can guard a Trey Young if you play him in a playing game, or maybe can guard a whatever other great guard there is in the East right now, Tyrese Maxey, for example. Uh, so he might be able to help a little bit. Plus, he's only 29 years old and actually shooting 37% from three. And Chris Dunn has an assist to turnover ratio of four to one, which, so maybe he can play like some backup facilitator role, which this Heat team desperately needs. But anyways, Chris Dunn is sort of just the throw-in, obviously. Uh, I think Larry Markkinen's fit with the Miami Heat is clear. I mean, if you want to talk about that starting lineup as a whole, it'd be Terry Rozier, Duncan Robinson, Jimmy Butler, Larry Markkinen, and Bam at a bio. Markkinen solves the rebounding issues. He solves the stretch four issues. Uh, he would just be undoubtedly a perfect fit on this team. And as a Heat team that's been struggling to score really of late, really over the last few seasons, now you're inserting a guy like Terry Rozier. You're losing Tyler Hero. I get that, but... Tyler Hero just had 12 points tonight on 4-14 shooting versus the Orlando Magic. So all the Tyler Hero stands out there, where the hell was your offensive superstar tonight? I don't know. But, you but you're still losing him. You insert Terry Rozier. You insert and Duncan Robinson into that starting lineup, who I think has better chemistry with Jimmy and Bam. And then Larry Markkinen in his 24 points per game on 50% from the field, 39% from three. He is efficient as all hell. And then I mentioned he could rebound the ball. Because against that giant ass Orlando Magic team, the Heat got killed tonight. 
and marketing would help that out a lot. So again, the Heat are losing Tyler Hero, who I think is a great player, but he's definitely underperforming. And I think even the biggest of Tyler Hero fans are the realistic ones, at least. There's some that don't listen to fact or reason and they just say Tyler Hero is their God and they preach and pray to him every night. But the more realistic Tyler Hero fans are starting to realize that there are some obvious flaws that can cause issues with this team. Now, again, I'm not a Tyler Hero hater. I love Tyler Hero. And I think if the Heat were to keep him, he'd be a big help to this team. I don't want to lose Tyler Hero. But I am in that group that thinks he's better off the bench. That's just how I feel about him. And for a guy making that much money, if I'm saying he's better off the bench, it probably makes more sense to trade him and try to get as much value in return as you can for him. Now, obviously, they're losing Caleb Martin, who I love a lot as well, but the Heat, uh, he has a player option in which he'll likely opt out and resign for more money elsewhere that the Heat can't afford to pay him, sort of like a Gabe Vincent situation. And then they'd be trading Nikola Jovic, who Heat fans hate when I add him to trade packages. But first off, he, he's been pretty terrible of late. He had a great start when he started being in the starting lineup, and Spose even started him the last two games with Lowry off the bench, which hasn't fixed nothing. They've still gone off to terrible starts. But Nikola Jovic can't make layups at the rim. The defense is improving, but it's still hit or miss. And it's clear that as great as a player as he'll be one day, he's still four or five years away from that and I think as Heat fans, we need to pick which window do we want to win in, the Jimmy Butler window or the future BAM window. Uh, and right now, I think Jimmy Butler is a superstar and he's earned the right for this organization to go all in around him. So I would like to do everything we can to win around him. And in my opinion, that includes trading Nikola Jovic. Now, I guess the last part of this, this trade is kind of what I call the inevitable trade with the Oklahoma City Thunder. We essentially swap first round picks. We send them a second round pick to incentivize them. And because of the Steffian rule, where you can't be missing first round picks and back-to-back -back seasons, this allows the Heat to now have three tradable first instead of one tradable first. And there's no reason for the Thunder not to do it because they net a second round pick for essentially nothing. Uh, so, like I said earlier, this would give the Heat a starting lineup of Terry Rozier, Duncan Robinson, Jimmy Butler, Larry Markinen, and Bam. And off the bench, they could play Josh Richardson as the backup one, two. Jame Hawkins as kind of the backup forward. Then you got Kevin Love and Hayward Highsmith as your backup fours. You know, Kevin Love is the backup five. Uh, and that right there gets you eight to nine deep. That doesn't even include Chris Dunn, who I think can contribute, like I was saying, and maybe Taylor Horton Tucker. So you theoretically have eight guys that you trust, nine to 10 guys that you could definitely play. And then on top of that, there's a list of buyout guys that I think, uh, well, I Googled potential buyout candidates and there's several guys there that I like a lot. For example, there's Alec Burks, who's a bit older on the Detroit Pistons. They don't really have a need for him at this point because they want to tank anyways. And it's not like he's super young uh, and he's shooting 40 percent from three. Could definitely get you some buckets off the bench to kind of mitigate a little bit of the scoring that you're losing with Tyler Hero. I also like Gordon Hayward, uh, who I don't want to speak a lot about because Ira said there's some rule with the new CBA basically saying that the Heat can't sign a buyout player whose current salary is more than league average. I don't fully understand enough why, but I don't think that he can actually sign Gordon Hayward if he was bought out. But uh, even outside of him, I like Doug McDermott a lot, a guy that's surprisingly 32 years old. Because I remember when the Bulls drafted him and I thought his offensive explosion with their defense was going to move worlds. And that team sucked. The Heat still beat that Chicago Bulls ass every year. Uh, but still, Doug McDermott's a guy that uh, is, on is only playing 15 minutes a night this season but he's shooting 45% from three on 3.6 attempts. So again, just kind of helps the bench shooting, especially if you're losing Tyler Hero. Uh, and I also like Patty Mills, who is barely playing this season. He's 35 years old, but we just saw him light up the heat the other night on UD retirement night. Uh, and obviously he's a high IQ veteran championship point guard that I think off the bench could provide a lot of value for this heat team. So that's kind of all I got to say for this video. Uh, I'm out of breath. I'm tired. My voice is gone. I just did the live stream coming to y'all with this video because uh, it's a frustrating time as Heat fans. That, that it definitely is. But if you do enjoy, do me the favor, like the video, make sure to subscribe, help do anything you can to push this video through the algorithm out to everyone else because I'm working real hard over here uh, and we're going to get through this together, Heat fans. It's going to be a very interesting three weeks coming up to that February 8th trade deadline. But We'll continue talking about all that as the weeks go on. So I'll see y'all next time.
Peace out. Look, pull up in the city, trying to get that dead fast. Sight. Do it on my own, I don't need no dead weight. Right. Had to kill him off, yeah, I need a headspace. You know this homegrown bitch don't offend me. Hmm.